Coming up on a new season of This American Land. They say, you know, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting, so any water project is going to be controversial. When water is a region's most precious resource, who gets it and when? Farmers are changing their ways to conserve every drop. It's just inappropriate to reflect this as this gold mine of, of water just readily available for the tapping. From renewable energy to social media, family farms are changing fast. Women are finally getting credit for the huge role they play. It's breathtaking. There's no place like it. 450 miles of the spectacular Smokies. Tourists flock to the Blue Ridge Parkway. And a shrimp stampede? They can also create eddies in the water column that are much larger than their individual body sizes. We'll shine a light on these tiny creatures' jumbo effect on our oceans. So check your focus and see how all these stories stack up, starting now on This American Land. Funding for this program provided by the Walton Family Foundation, the McKnight Foundation, and the Horner Family Fund. Hey everyone and welcome to This American Land. I'm your host Ed Arnett and it's great to be back with you for this new season. We've got some terrific stories coming up about the conservation of America's natural resources, our landscapes, waters, wildlife, and the people that are dedicated to conservation across the country. We'll start today in Colorado where fast population growth in the Denver area and fierce competition for water is driving investors behind a plan to import water from a mountain valley hundreds of miles away, facing opposition from farmers and ranchers who depend on that water in the valley. Our story is reported by Jared Smith of Freshwater News. The San Luis Valley is largely dependent on its agricultural economy. And that economy is driven by a water system that includes the mighty Rio Grande River and a huge aquifer. And both of those are fed by the snowmelt that comes off of these beautiful mountains that we see all around us. I'm Jared Smith with Freshwater News, and we're here in the San Luis Valley in Southern Colorado to talk about water. So these are uh, Reveille russet potatoes. We're Worley Family Farms. We're a family farming operation, five generations, and we've been raising potatoes for probably 70 some years here. We're highly dependent on our snowpack for our water source. We're a high mountain desert. We don't get but about six to seven inches of rainfall per year. The aquifer has been under a tremendous amount of stress in the past several years, not unlike other states in the American West. There's been a 19 year drought and the flows in the river have been shrinking, and as a result, the aquifer is shrinking as well. This is an alfalfa crop. And this alfalfa is watered via the aquifer that lies underneath these fields. Yes. As a community, we all want this to be sustainable, whether you have surface water or well water. The fact that the river and the aquifer no longer have the water supplies that they once did means that there's a tremendous amount of pressure over who gets the water when. Meanwhile, a company in Denver called Renewable Water Resources, or RWRs, is proposing to export 22,000 acre feet of water, that's roughly enough for 44,000 homes or so, to the suburbs of Denver, the southern suburbs, which are desperate for water because they're growing so fast. And their proposition here in the valley is, look, you guys need to reduce the amount of water you're using to protect the aquifer. Why not sell it to us? Sean Toner, you're a Colorado native. You have a company that has a very big idea about a new water project here in Colorado, and it's a controversial idea. 
Absolutely, and they say, you know, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting. So any water project is going to be controversial out here in the West. And so our vision is to move 22,000 acre feet uh, from the San Luis Valley via pipeline um, up to the Platte River and then floated along the river into Denver. We believe it can be a win-win for one of the poorest parts of the state to benefit one of the parts of the state that's very poor on water. Your company is offering millions of dollars in support to the region. We're proposing a $50 million community fund. We're proposing $68 million to retire water rights so farmers uh, would benefit, the community would benefit, uh, and $50 million goes quite a long way in, in the San Luis Valley. But this is, a, this is a region that has an historic, fiercely proud agricultural tradition. The leaders on the agriculture side, the folks opposed to our project, they all recognize that the valley, in order to be healthy, needs to be a more diversified economy. Potatoes um, probably aren't the best crop to be growing, at least in the magnitude that they grow them in the San Luis Valley. And why is that? It's a heavy water intensive crop. We've got to transform our agricultural based economy into uh, products that use less water. Sean, th this idea is causing a huge amount of controversy in the Valley, a lot of anger, a lot of anxiety. How are you dealing with that and how are you addressing those concerns? Yeah, I think the first part is uh, education. Uh, many folks in the Valley don't realize, uh, to quote the Denver Post, uh, Saudi San Luis Valley is the Saudi Arabia of water. So that, that's a misleading statement, Jared, because it's just factually from an engineering and hydrologic standpoint, just not accurate. This is Cleve Simpson. He's general manager of the Rio Grande Water Conservation District. The system has been on steady decline for the last 20 years. If there was this abundant source of water and renewable source of water, you would see our aquifer systems actually flourishing. It's just inappropriate to reflect this as this panacea or this gold mine of, of water just readily available for the tapping. Uh, item 19 this district has been actively involved in every one of these water export proposals, which happen on about every decade since 1972, and have been successful in defeating all, all efforts to really transport water out of this basin. What are some of the most promising alternatives to maintaining this historic ag economy, even under pressure from the Front Range? Farmers are pretty resilient and several things happen. You get immediate conservation efforts. You see people thinking about how and when they run their irrigation systems, how they irrigate their crop. And then secondly, it's been amazing to watch people considering alternative crops. You know, we've changed our irrigation practices dramatically. Greg, how far are we from the Rio Grande River here? At this point, we're about eight miles from the diversion off the river. This is Greg Heigl, a local uh, farmer here in the San Luis Valley. Since the early 2000s, we've been in roughly a drought, and we went from flood irrigation to pretty much strictly sprinkler irrigation. And when you went to sprinklers, they're more efficient, your crop's more efficient, so there's no overuse of water. How do you feel about the proposal to export water out of the valley? Oh, I feel very strongly against it. Uh, I've been around water all my life, and every time some water is taken out of a basin, it's never good for the basin. Actually, this one scares me because we've been going through well regulation now and this water scheme is going to use the rules to get it done. He, they're coming after us as a community thing, like they will help us, they'll put money into the valley and help the economy. And I've been around long enough that it doesn't help the area when they do this. We know there are farmers out there who think this export proposal has merit but we could not convince anyone to go on camera to talk about it because it's such a controversial, divisive topic down here, sometimes pitting neighbor against neighbor. As the water crisis intensifies in the American Southwest, cities who don't have water will pursue those who do. Without question, ways will have to be found to share water. 
between agricultural communities and the cities who so desperately need it. In states like Colorado, a fair solution can't come soon enough. I'm Jared Smith of Freshwater News, reporting for the Water Desk. In hot and dry Texas, where farming is a hard and risky way of life, women play a serious role in managing how farms are run and how conservation is practiced to protect soil and water. We went to South Texas to meet a woman who has embraced her role as a full partner in running the family farm. Today, there's so many different roles for women in agriculture. When I went to college, my degree was economics. So there was a steep, steep learning curve. My perspective, especially coming from a non-ag background, has been to question. I want to know what seed we're planting. I want to know how much everything's costing us. And, you know, why are we doing it this way? What is the purpose of this? Is there a better way? Is there a different way? How can we be more efficient? And so over the years, my role has, has grown. Being part of a farm family was never on my horizon. However, I met John. We decided to get married. Big pivot, here we are. Before we got married, I probably shared the visions of what a farm is with uh, so many other Americans. You know, a very romanticized 50 acres, a cow, a pig, maybe chickens. It's very different than what the reality is. You know, big combines, big cotton pickers. However, we still have some things in common with that romanticized vision. We still have to work with what's given to us weather-wise. We still have unpredictability, and we have to do it in a manner that is cost-effective. Okay, right I'm fourth generation in my family to farm. We've been farming for the same land a couple of blocks for over, over 100 years. My name is John Watley. I run a family farm with my wife, Kelly, my two sons. We farm several thousand acres of cotton, corn, and grain sorghum. So is that the big one you were talking about? We also have a cow-calf operation. The way I've seen farm evolve is the size of operations. Economy of scales is important. We have slowly changed farming practices throughout the years through new technology. Survival sometimes in agricultural is your only goal. Your goal is to be here for next year. We're in Beeville, Texas. This is a um, feed store. We started in 2017 to kind of meet the local needs of ranchers and farmers in the area, deliver horse feed, cattle feed. There's your alpaca diet. One thing that separates Blue Ribbon from other feed stores, it's our attention to customer service. By having our small business be economically sustainable, we're able to contribute to the community at large. Sections of the store, we have boots, the men's clothing, the kids section, we have the women's clothing, jewelry, accessories. Your kimono. All right. <laughs> hey, men can wear kimonos too. Exactly. We want things that are unique that you do not find in any other store in the area. All sorts of animal health products. Your cattle needs to be vaccinated. There are five women that run the store with five distinct personalities. I like graphic design, advertising, and social media, so that's my strength. One reason we decided to jump in with the group that was starting the store is in agriculture, we're depending on the weather and the markets, and that's not in our control. So we decided we needed to diversify our income. I'm very involved in the visual presentation of the store. Here's some of the photos from this year's crop. And I've started out on the farm taking pictures. I think it is important to share what it is that we do on the farm. We're very transparent. A few more days before this field is ready to pick. We're happy to let people know what we're doing. And one way that we do that is with social media. I come from exactly the same place most people walking in a grocery store come from. We are just about 15 to 20 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. Like them, I want to have safe and healthy food for my kids. 
I want to make sure that we're leaving this world as a whole as a better place. So I fully get where today's mom is coming from. Me and my brother have been really lucky growing up. We've been able to be out here and really understand how we have a part in protecting that natural resource. Uh, three or four years after I started farming, I got involved in NRCS. One of the first things I ever did was I did a big land loving project and we started doing more soil conservation. I wanted to figure out a way to protect my soil. After Hurricane Harvey, it damaged our windmill. We decided to go in with a uh, water well that's um, solar powered and do the NRCS program. They help you with the expertise. When the sun's out, the water starts pumping. As you can see, the water is now starting to pump into this water trough. So I've always got a fresh trough for the cattle. I just think that there's a better way to build the mouse trap. There's a lot of give and take, and that's the best part about the NRCS, is they help you modify plans, and, and they're flexible enough to say, hey, this didn't work this year. Let's, let's change the plan a little bit in another direction. These retention ponds, they all slowly filter down to a couple of places where they have to work underneath the road. It's important to me that what we do here, I understand that it affects more people. Oh, there it is, see it? We care about what Mother Nature brings through us to put back into the bay, and we want it to be for there for a long time. The filter system's working, because uh, we've got healthy animal life right here. I love, you know, raising my animals, but I want them to be a part, a solid part of, of the ecosystem. John loves farming, loves farming. It is in his blood. I don't see how you can do this today if it's not in your blood. You know, there's so much risk. There's so much unknown. Over the years, my role has grown. I do all the financial stuff. I do all the bookkeeping. And it's taken some of the stress and pressure off him. He can worry about what does the crop actually look like, and I can worry about what does the crop actually cost us. We still have many unknowns that we have to deal with. We just do it in different ways, and we have to do it in a manner that is cost-effective so that we are here for the long run. Now let's go to Virginia and North Carolina. Along the Blue Ridge Parkway, that runs for more than 400 miles through some of the most stunning Appalachian landscapes and where conservationists are actively trying to protect those natural views with support from the Land and Water Conservation Fund. It's one of the nation's most important conservation funders, and you'll see why. The Blue Ridge Parkway is a linear national park stretching more than 450 miles from Virginia down through North Carolina. And what it's done is link a lot of these rural communities together, but it's also been an incredible tourism draw for some of these areas. Well, you certainly see the Smokies and you can probably see into Tennessee and it's just beautiful. It's breathtaking, there's no place like it. I mean, you can go to the Rockies, you can go to the Cascades in Washington or Alaska, but there's really nowhere else in this world or even in this country that's like the Blue Ridge Mountains here. I like it because you can see the sunset in one direction and the moonrise in the other. The Land and Water Conservation Fund has protected tracks along the Blue Ridge Parkway to ensure that the visitor experience stays the same, that the inspiring view sheds are unimpeded by incompatible development and that visitors leave refreshed and renewed after seeing some of the most spectacular fall foliage or sunrises or sunsets along the Blue Ridge Parkway. There it is, one or two people or 25, 30 people, it just seems to get quiet and all seems to be well by just sitting out looking over the Smokies and I've not seen it like this anywhere else. Well, we certainly are blessed to have this beautiful county. It's just uh, Mother Nature at its finest. Happy to have Lynn Collins with Haywood County Tourism Development Authority here with us today up at Water Rock Knob. Lynn, as you know, a lot of this area has been protected with the Land and Water Conservation Fund. What would you see happening if some of these conservation opportunities that come up with landowners weren't able to be protected? Well, we, we lose those views and then people don't see a reason to come. If there's development, then they complain about seeing that development. That's not what they come here for. So we need to make sure that we are able to preserve and protect those lands. 
So when a raindrop falls up by the Blue Ridge Parkway on Water Rock Knob, where does it go? It's coming into our watershed, and that's why the protection of this is so important to us. I'm here with Neil Carpenter at Water Rock Knob. Neil is the general manager of the Maggie Valley Sanitary District. The threat to us is second home development. It's not necessarily agriculture or it's not industry. It's the second home communities. They're not dumping pollution into the creeks. What's the threat there? It's, it's the erosion, sedimentation coming from that road and building sites is, is our main threat. We just try to balance uh, protecting the high tops and the watersheds with more sensible building areas. And, uh, you know, we want the people to come, but we also want to protect our, our mountains as well. Wild trout streams are the lifeblood of a lot of the cultural history of this part of Appalachia. More pavement leads to higher uh, runoff coming from that pavement, and that pavement heats up the water when it's running off of it. So it leads to higher water temperatures. Fish don't like that. Trout love cold water. Yeah. We like it shady. We like it good for, for trout so that people can come up here and experience what this has got to offer. So I'm looking over your shoulder, Neil, at 1,600 acres owned by the Nature Conservancy, and we've got acreage here owned by the Conservation Fund, Southern Appalachian Highlands Conservancy over that ridge. Sure. What does that add to the Blue Ridge Parkway corridor? Protecting those vistas, that's what uh, people come here to see. In every county, and every state, local people are identifying their own conservation need and then reaching out to their local land trusts or to one of the national conservation organizations and begging them to buy their land to add it to the conservation mix. Land and Water Conservation Fund is the source of those funds when we're working with a willing seller. So conservation in America is really grassroots. This is not a federal land grab. These are projects that support local economies and support uh, what the locals want, and that's conservation and recreation opportunities that are close to home. How the ocean works, how its water churns, rises, sinks, and flows, is a subject that scientists are trying to understand. In a project at Stanford University, researchers are studying how vertical migrations of tiny marine animals contribute to ocean mixing. In this Science Nation report, Miles O'Brien has more. Lights, camera, action. Welcome to the magic of the movies. These aren't special effects. These are real images of brine shrimp undergoing what's called a vertical migration. So we have a tank of brine shrimp. They are representative of marine zooplankton such as krill in terms of their size and their swimming mode. With support from the National Science Foundation, engineers John DeBeery and Isabel Houghton want to better understand how vertical migrations of tiny marine animals like krill contribute to ocean mixing. We're very interested in how the ocean works because that's going to determine our future here on Earth. The ocean is the primary sink of our carbon emissions. It provides fish for a lot of coastal communities, really for the entire world. And so we're interested in its health and its future. Scientists have long chalked up ocean mixing to winds and tides. But now it looks like that's not the whole story. Oceans are teeming with shrimp-like krill. They're the base of the marine food chain. Every night, they migrate in giant swarms to the surface to feed. When you have millions of these organisms doing that, we thought there was the possibility that that downward motion of the water might start to add up, almost like a stampede that occurs at the end of each day. In the lab, they recreate the vertical migrations using sensors and high-speed cameras to follow what happens as the shrimp swim through different concentrations of salt water. Their experiments show that all that kicking really does contribute to some serious churn in the water. So we found, surprisingly, that these small animals can have an enormous impact on the mixing of the water column, and that they can also create eddies in the water column that are much larger than their individual body sizes. As the saying goes, there's power in numbers. One swimming shrimp 
is no big deal, but millions or even trillions swimming together, that's a different story. Dabiri says these vertical migrations are key to understanding how our oceans work. What we're trying to do is understand those processes that drive ocean circulation, for example, because that's going to allow us to predict what happens with future climate. If these organisms are playing a significant role in the ocean, then that's an important feature that we need to add to our calculations of what will happen to global climate in the coming years. Mixing it up in the lab, discovering these tiny sea creatures to be far more than bit players in our oceans. They're more like the stars of the show. For Science Nation, I'm Miles O'Brien. And now, here's a quick look at stories from our next show. If we don't have this wild space, we're, we're going to be lost as humans. The Appalachian Trail is the gold standard for hikers. Protecting it is a constant challenge. Next time on This American Land. That's all for now, and thanks for joining us. And we'll see you next time on This American Land. And be sure to listen to our podcast and check us out on social media. For more information about this program, visit thisamericanland.org, listen to our podcasts, and like us on Facebook. Funding for this program provided by the Walton Family Foundation, the McKnight Foundation, and the Horner Family Fund.